damn late. I had to stop by the wax museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. <laughs> well, we ain't killing they army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, again, introducing our friend uh, Ray McGovern. This is not the same interview you just heard. It's an entirely different one. Uh, hey, Ray, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Scott. Very happy to have you here. You were an analyst at the CIA for 27 years, starting and ending when? Uh, starting in early 63 and ending uh, with George H.W. Bush uh, in office in January of 1990. All right, then. So... Um, and, and we'll get to that aspect of this story here in a bit, because I think there is one, if I remember right. Um, but uh, let's just start with the basics here. It's June the 8th, 2018. So that makes it the anniversary, again, of the Israeli attack on the USS Liberty. Uh, what's the USS Liberty, Ray? Well, it was a Navy ship, uh, but it was outfitted to collect uh, electronic and other technical information from uh, places where we needed intelligence. It operated in international waters. Uh, it had just been refurbished, and it was the most expensive intelligence collection uh, mechanism in, in history. Uh, and it was sailing in international waters off the Sinai uh, during the uh, Six-Day War in, uh, in June uh, 1967, so 51 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, but so the Israelis are our most bestest friends in the whole wide world, it's said on TV. And so I think that, uh, geez, if this really happened at all, which I'm very suspicious of, I'm pretending to be for the sake of this question, uh, then it must have been a big accident. <laughs> right, right. Um, let me, let me uh, approach this, Scott, in a, in a personal way. Uh, I move in circles where I had long since known about this uh, disaster and how the United States government, the United States Congress, and to its discredit, the United States Navy had all covered up the fact that Israel undeniably, uh, with tangible evidence that we have, uh, on purpose tried to sink the USS Liberty and leave no survivors. I will say that again sink the USS Liberty. It had a crew of about 280, as I recall, and leave no survivors. Uh, long story short, they did kill 34. Uh, they did wound over 170. And they're about to complete the job when one <laughs> enterprising young sailor from Texas uh, put together with bailing wire uh, a connection to a radar that the, re that the Israelis had not knocked out. They knocked out all the others. They hadn't knocked out this one because it had not been active for weeks. Well, Terry Harbajay connected those wires, sent out an SOS, and immediately the Israelis uh, got out of Dodge, so to speak. They broke off the uh, patrol boat, the PT boat uh, uh, attacks, one of which had shot a torpedo midships. And uh, they broke off the strafing of the of the lifeboats, and uh, the the aircraft went home, and the PT boats went home. Uh, the commander of that part of the naval fleet in the Mediterranean immediately dispatched fighter bombers from the USS Saratoga and the USS America uh, to uh, relieve uh, one of his uh, ships that was under attack. They were called back. They were called back by none other than well, first Secretary of Defense McNamara. But then when Admiral Geitz had the guts to say, Sir, uh, Mr. McNamara, uh, one of my ships is under attack. 
uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to recall the fighter bombers on their way to do battle with whoever is attacking them. Uh, I need to speak to your supervisor. Whoa. <laughs> Guess what? OBJ gets on the line. And he says, now you all call those, call those planes back. We don't want to put a black mark on our ally Israel. Do it now and do it quickly. And so he did. Unbelievable. Now, uh, so this is, you know, this is all available in evidence. It's just not available in most U.S. newspapers. What I was uh, thinking of is Wait, let's just it. dwell on that point for just one second. An admiral, and you already did, but I like it. Sorry. An admiral says to the Secretary of Defense, yeah, I'm not buying that. I want to talk to your boss. And then Lyndon Baines Johnson gets on the line and tells this admiral to refute, to not defend, to call back his planes and not defend an American ship that is being attacked by a foreign government, a foreign military. Yeah, the, the gutsy thing that Admiral Gates did, of course, was insist on speaking uh, a rank above McNamara, the defense secretary, who really is dubiously in the chain of command anyway. So he wanted to talk to the commander in chief. But when the commander in chief told him what to do, <laughs> well, you know, these people don't become admirals by refusing to obey orders. He did what he what he was told to do. And um, the good news was that the SOS saved the day. In other words, uh, the Israelis intercepted it right away. They said, oh, my goodness, we better get out of here. And they did. And so there were survivors. And so there was a ship that was able to uh, just just barely make it back to Malta to be uh, you know, so that so the bodies could be taken off. And and the the men, the men were were taken to uh, to Greece and um, each one of them, each one of the survivors uh, was visited by a senior uh, Navy officer, commander, uh, and they were told, look, um, you are not allowed to say anything about what happened today. You're not allowed to talk about this with your fellow crew people, or your crew members. They're all men at those, those days. Um, and you are not allowed to discuss this even with your wife. And if you do, we're going to court-martial you. That was the first thing that was administered to these guys as they received first aid uh, in, in, uh, in Greece. So now... You want to know what PTSD looks like, Scott? You, you, want to, you want to see what it really looks like? Well, you, you talk to one of those crew members who for years, for 20, 30 years, were unable to share this hard experience. Uh, everything, not only the shoot up, but the cover up. My God, with even their, 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 uh, their wives under pain of court martial. So... What I thought I'd do is, is just get into this in a personal way because they started to say I knew I knew the story, but I didn't know any of the people. And you know, if you're not there, you don't have an immediate uh, touch with with what happened. And if uh, if you don't know any people, well, you're you're double removed in my view. So uh, what happened? Well, uh, gosh, it must be about 15 years ago that the Professor John Mearsheimer from the University of Chicago and Stephen Walt from Harvard wrote this incredible book. It was called The Israel Lobby. Okay. Now, <laughs> they, they did it. Uh, it was first an article. It was commissioned by the Atlantic magazine. And when they saw the draft, they said, oh, my, uh, you know, uh, thanks very much, but no thanks. Uh, oh, no, no, we don't, uh, we'll give you We'll give you, a, you know, a severance or whatever it is they call it, uh, but a kill, a kill uh, um, stipend. But no, we can't publish it. They couldn't get it published anywhere. They had to go to the London Review of Books to get it published. Okay, now it was very explosive. It listed all the ways in which the Israel lobby uh, exercised its power in this country, in the United States. So here it is, uh, published by the London Review of Books, and uh, McGovern gets a hold of it, and he's going down to give a talk in a place called Springfield, Missouri, okay? <laughs> it's an obscure, well, it's a sizable town, uh, but this church wanted to be come down there. It was 300 people in this uh, this audience, and so on the way down, I read, I, read this, uh, I read this article. I said, my God, holy Moses. 
I arrived there, I was talking about Iraq at the time, that was the live issue. And uh, toward the end, we had a Q&A, and, and one of the people said, now, Mr. McGovern, um, uh, what do you think about the U.S. as liberty? Or no, that, that's not what they thought. They said, what do you think of uh, Mearsheimer and Waltz, the most recent article in London Review of Books? And I, and I, <laughs> I said, thank you, thank you, Jesus. You know, I just read it. You know? So I said, well, you know, I just read it on a plane, and I think it's excellent. But the one thing I don't understand is if they're adducing evidence as to how Israel has inordinate influence on the United States, they missed they miss the most convincing episode, and that is the, the shooting up of the uh, USS Liberty on June 8th, 1967. I can't understand why they, why they would miss that. I mean, that one showed that the Israelis can literally get away with murder. Now, I looked out at that audience, Scott, 300 people there, and everybody had this look of, why? Yes, it's I am I didn't know. So I said, well, how many, how many of you know about the attack on the USS Liberty? Three people raised their hands, okay? So one in the way in the back, one in the middle. So I called one in the front. I said, uh, sir, could you get up and to tell us how you, uh, you know about the USS Liberty? Well, the guy gets up, ramrod straight. He says, Sergeant Bryce Lockwood, U.S. Marine Corps, member of USS Liberty Crew, sir. <laughs> so, so McGovern says, well, um, uh, would you be able to come up and, and tell us what happened? I mean, that would be better than me recount. Sir, I have, I have not been able to, I have not been able to do that, but it's been, it's been 35 years now. I would like to try today, tonight. Yes, sir. He marches up, right? And he spends 10 minutes behind the microphone telling about how his entire contingent of Marine radio intercept operators was demolished by the Israeli torpedo that hit him midships. That the only reason he was uh, able to escape was that he was behind the bulwark. Uh, he had the sensitive encryption uh, machinery that he was about to drop with a very large boulder over the side so that no one get it, could get it. And uh, just to recount uh, how he had to go back down into that compartment, he, he, he was able to rescue one of the guys that was still alive. Another guy he had by the he had by the hand, okay, and he was trying. Mean, somebody closed the hatch for God's sake. He bangs on the hatch. They open the hatch, and he's pulling this other guy, and he slips. The slips out of his reach, and goes through the great hole uh, into the Mediterranean. Well, Bryce Lockwood, uh, he calls himself the Old Sarge. He's still fitting, fitting, fit as a fiddle. Um, he told that story, and everyone was, uh, was duly moved, and that, that freed him up and freed a lot of his colleagues to tell that terrible story as to what happened, how the Israeli aircraft uh, reconnoitered the USS Liberty during the morning of June 8th, 1967. You know, they're very friendly. Of course, there was, you know... Uh, they had Israeli markings, and they, the pilot would be waving, and some of the sailors that were off duty would be sunbathing. And, oh, very, very genial. And then all of a sudden, unmarked aircraft came back, mirages, French mirages, and shot up all the antennae first on the, on the Liberty, and then started spreading napalm and all kinds of other stuff to kill the crew and sink the ship. Now, uh, I have to tell you this vignette, too, because it's a very personal experience, and uh, it has to do with a lot of things. One is this, uh, that the sailor, his name was Terry Harbajier. He was from Texas. I think he was 20 at the time, 20 years old. Uh, he says to uh, Captain McGonagall, he said, Captain, uh, I think that I can get that radar working, you know, the one that the uh, Israelis don't know works, uh, but I need to connect it with this uh, with this plug and the bailing wire. And McGonagall looks at him and he says, Carbazier, what are you going to do? Swim across the napalm? Na what are we gonna, you, you're good at swimming across the napalm? Carbazier says, I'd like to try, sir. Permission granted. He connects it. 
and gets the signal out. Only way that the ship wasn't sunk with the entire crew of what 280 or whatever it was uh, killed. Mm. Now, why do I mention that? Well, because gradually, and especially when Admiral Thomas Moore, who had been joint, joint, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, when he took an active interest in this case, some of it started to leak out. Some of the crewmen uh, were actually uh, courageous enough to write books about it. And all of a sudden, I learned that Terry Hollebardier is going to be given the Silver Star. Now, that's just below the, the Medal of Honor, right? I said, who's going to give him that? Uh, this congressman out there in the Central Valley of California. When? Next Wednesday. I get on a plane and I get out there and I get there the morning of the presentation. A modest uh, conference, a modest uh, press conference with local media there and about seven or eight of the survivors, a couple of them I already knew. I had not met Terry Halbardier. It turned out he was working for the local congressman there, a fellow named Devin Nunes, who had the guts to insist that the army approve a silver star for his staffer, Terry Halbardier. The ceremony was <laughs> was not uh, with great flourish. It was, it was very earnest and everyone was just delighted that Terry got recognition for saving the ship and the crew. We went out to lunch after that. And I tell you, when I said before, if you wanna know what PTSD looks like, think about, think about sailors who went through this experience and then were told they couldn't confide even to their wives as to what really happened. Think about all the lies that were told that it was a great big mistake by the Israelis. We know it wasn't a mistake. We have intercepted communications from pilot to ground crew, ground control. Okay, here, here it is. That's an American ship. That's an American flag. <clears throat> follow your orders. But, but, but it's an American. Do what you're told. Follow your orders. Boom. Okay. So it's not like we're making this stuff up. It's out there in... Uh, uh, actually, it was used as case studies in intelligence school at Fort Hollabird when the intelligence school was there. So, so if I feel uh, a little emotional about this, well, I think that anybody who has had even those secondhand experience with actual people involved in this, uh, if you're not emotional, you're not human. Hey, y'all, Scott here. Here's how to support the show. Uh, Patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show if you want to donate per interview. Um, and also scotthorton.org slash donate. Uh, anyone who donates $20 gets a copy of the audiobook of Fool's Errand. Anyone who donates $50, that'll get you a signed copy of the paperback in the mail there. And anyone who donates $100 gets either a QR code commodity disc or a lifetime subscription, now only for $100, not two, a lifetime subscription to Listen and Think audiobooks, uh, libertarian audiobooks, listenandthink.com. There, so check out all that stuff, and of course, we take all your different digital currencies, especially Zen Cash, and all the different kinds of bitcoins and whatevers, uh, are all there at scotthorton.org/slash/donate, and um, uh, get the book "Fool's Errand," uh, and give it a good review on Amazon if you read it and you liked it, and review the show on uh, you know iTunes and Stitcher and that kind of thing if you want. All right, thanks. All right, well, so tell me about what was going on at CIA headquarters in 1967 when the Israelis attacked an NSA ship and LBJ and McNamara helped them get away with it. I mean, and I know you guys are all supposed to be compartmentalized and you're an analyst, not a spy, and I don't know what, but certainly everybody's gossiping, at least in the cafeteria at lunchtime, that like, man, did you hear what the Israelis did or not or what? Tell me. Yeah, well, I was working on uh, Soviet foreign policy at the time, but of course the Russians were involved in the Middle East as well, so I had a window into this. Um, there was a uh, really interesting schizophrenia in among the analysts of Israel, Arab states at CIA. <clears throat> One thing that will boggle your mind is this. Now, when I arrived in 1963, 64, and started to get, get my uh, sea legs, and wandering around, finding out who else is involved, particularly in, in, in the Middle East, since the uh, Soviet Union was so much involved there, 
I learned or looked around and I saw, whoa, huh. you know, in the Arab Israeli branch, there are no people <laughs> of Jewish extraction. And I said to myself, holy Moses, that's odd. I wonder, I wonder if this is deliberate. So I chose my time carefully and I asked the branch chief there, I say, you, you have no people of Jewish extraction here. Is that, is that an accident? He says, no, it's not an accident, right? Um, you know, uh, we, uh, we just think that in order to, to get the really objective analysis here, and it's just a precaution. He said, we don't have any Arabs either. You notice that? I said, yeah, I noticed that. And he said, so now what was McGovern's reaction? <laughs> Big liberal McGovern. You know, he said, oh, that's terrible. That's an American. Oh, that's what does here. How can you, how can you do that? You know, well, guess what? <laughs> guess what? It was a very enlightened policy. And I'll just fast forward to now. Well, wait a minute, though, you terrible uh, anti-Semite you for remembering that um what about mix on uh uh irish policy <laughs> or whatever you know is it do you, okay. do, is it was, right. it was it like that on everything or is it just jews in israel well you know it's really funny you should uh, mention that because <clears throat> later i i had a higher office i was the acting national intelligence officer for western europe okay now that was in the 70s mid 70s when all hell broke loose in Northern Ireland. Now, I know a lot about Ireland. I have cousins there, I've been there many, many times, and I was deathly afraid <laughs> that the head of analysis would come down and say, McGovern, <clears throat> you know a lot about Ireland. We want you to be the analyst on the troubles there between North and South Ireland and what's going on, the, the, the troubles that are going on, in, uh, as they call them, in Northern Ireland. Now, I would have to say, uh, Scott, I would have to say, no way, no way will I take that job. Uh, my ethos in intelligence and the ethos of those around me in those days was we need to be really, really careful not to let any personal bias interfere with our analysis. And it is constitutionally impossible for me, for my constitution, for me to be objective about what's going on in Northern Ireland. Sorry, Mr. Casey, I can't do that. Find somebody else. Mm. But that they didn't even strong. ask you, or they did? No, they didn't. <laughs> they, they didn't even ask you, so you didn't have to turn it down. That's correct. But, you know, I was worried, and I kept thinking about this, because not many people knew much about what was going on in Ireland, and, you know, most of the data was coming from MI6 and MI5, and, you know, British friends were, were giving a slightly slanted view of what's going on there. But I held my peace. I chipped in with the analysts themselves as to what I knew, but no one asked me to do that. But, you know, that's uh, so, so look, I mean, but yeah, to be clear about this, this is not some kind of, you know, old school, latent, uh, you know, bigotry in the system that you're reminiscing about here. This is just simply professionalism and trying to prevent conflicts of interest when it comes to intelligence analysis. Right. I mean, I'm exactly sorry, we're kind right. of off on a tangent here, but it's important. Yeah, well, I'm glad we're on that tangent because it, it is a very important uh, consideration. Um you know, it's really hard. It's very difficult because let's say you want somebody who knows a whole lot about Egypt or Syria. Well, most of the people will be of Arab extraction, you know, and it's really hard uh, to find people equally competent, but you can. And what I'm saying here is that the people who had their heads screwed on correctly uh, in the early 60s, at least, uh, made a conscious effort to make sure that they got those people, people with with no dual dual allegiance, as we say, uh, no um, no people who qualify for Israeli or Arab citizenship. Uh, so, you know, that's that was really really important. And I need to say that right now, and what I know of the last two decades, uh, the Arab Israeli branch is uh, run by and populated mostly by people who are of Jewish extraction. There are very few people who give a balanced view with respect to what the Arabs' grievances are, what the Palestinian situation is all about. That's very different from the old days, and it's part of the total corruption of the analysis division of CIA. I'll say one more thing, Scott, because it's important. Uh, even with this... Um, 
even with this unbiased crew of analysts back in the 60s, well, we'll talk about 67 when, when the, uh, the attack took place on the Liberty. Uh, there was this real, real respect and admiration for the Israeli military capability. You know, the Arabs were looked on as uh, kind of uh, feckless, militarily speaking. Of course, they weren't in receipt of any of our weaponry. That's one of the reasons, of course. Uh, but there was this prejudice, really. I think that's not too too strong a word. Uh, when the Israelis struck out at something with their uh, U.S. equipment, they usually succeeded. So there was this uh, almost overt admiration for Israel's military capability. Now, with respect to the incident itself, uh, we were really worried that the Russians would get overtly involved uh, on behalf of the Arabs. Uh, after all, um, the Russians and we and everyone else who followed that situation knew that the Israeli justification uh, for this attack was what in the Bronx we call a crock. OK, now, how do I know that? Well, um, you know, you have to take McGovern's word for it. Um, it was uh, none other than former Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin. Now, this was 35 years ago, but this is what he said in the speech, and this is what was reported in the New York Times. Uh, 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 surprise, surprise. I quote, <clears throat> this is Menachem Begin, former Prime Minister of Israel. In June 1967, we had a choice. The Egyptian army concentrations and the Sinai approaches do not prove do not prove that Nasser was really about to attack us. We must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him. New York Times, August 1982. So I guess, you know, you feel a little headstrong every now and then. You're a former prime minister. You tell the truth. And I'll just repeat. Nasser was not really about to attack us. We must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him. Now, we know that as a result of that attack and that war, Israel occupied territories for the last 51 years in Palestinian lands. In Gaza, which is a, the biggest open air prison in, in the world's history, in the West Bank. And I was just there last year at this time. Uh, that was what the late, what the Russian, <laughs> sorry, or the Germans, or the Nazis called Lebensraum, okay, room to live, uh, widen the borders. And, and what uh, the Israelis have been doing ever since is colonizing those areas, uh, putting down the, Isra the, the Arab and Palestinian populations. And uh, so here we have the prime minister uh, admitting that uh, it was a war of aggression uh, but the Israeli influence with the United States, first and foremost, but also in Western Europe, particularly Germany, where the Germans all still have a, a very guilty conscience, which they should. Uh, there can't be any balanced view of this thing so that the Israel so that the Palestinians will be given a fair shot at a decent life. By the way, I just want to mention here one more uh, footnote for that uh, six days in Israel, 45 years ago. And this is by Miko Peled, who's the son of a powerful former Israeli general. And he tells his own side of that and says that it was the military cabinet, whatever, the, the very top group of, of generals, and then the civilian cabinet. And the prime minister at the time was relatively weak. And the Egyptians had made the mistake of moving their, uh, you know, much of their armor within range. Uh, where the Israelis could hit him without having to uh, get any nearer, basically, and that this wasn't a threat. And the only question was not whether, oh, what are the Egyptians going to do and are we going to defend ourselves or anything like that. It was simply, are we going to take advantage of this opportunity or are you going to let it pass by, you weakling prime minister? And the prime minister gave in to the generals and they launched the war. And that's six days in Israel, 45 years ago, from the son of the general who did it. Yeah, well, that's Miko Peled. And, uh, you know, what he says, you can take to the bank. He's a close personal friend of mine. 
Matter of fact, we'll be together this afternoon at DuPont Circle in Washington, uh, speaking at a major rally on behalf of those poor people in Gaza, 120 of whom killed and thousands injured. You know what, let's talk about Gaza, because there's so much to talk about, but hang on a second, because we still got some USS Liberty stuff here. Now, okay. so we I, we have to assume, and I probably didn't set this up very good at the beginning anyway, Ray, but I don't know. Uh, but assuming, you know, for people who aren't familiar with this story at all, it sounds kind of crazy. I mean, obviously, you know what you're talking about. It must have happened, but help people understand how this happened, why this happened. Uh, it seems like an awful risk for Israel to attack an American Navy ship for any reason or pretext. Was this, um, what was it, Ray? Well, uh, we have to make a, a really clear distinction between what happened, and we know chapter and verse on that. I already mentioned some of the intercepted messages, pilot to control, control tower, and why it happened. We don't know exactly why it happened. Uh, we have some theories, uh, and you know, uh, we could probably find out if we just went and asked the Israelis. <laughs> Can you imagine? You know? Yeah. That's, you know, that's you should the, ask Miko Pellet. Does he know? No, no, he didn't. Well, you know, the theories are, and this is the best one in my view, <clears throat> um, they knew that the USS Liberty was collecting all the intelligence that was available in the air or in the ether. Uh, right outside, uh, right in international waters, mind you, uh, 13 miles off uh, the Sinai. Now, um, there are two possible explanations that have equal merit in my view. One is that uh, uh, the Israelis were about to go up and take the Golan Heights from Syria the next day. In those days, there was no way for the Israelis to prepare that kind of offensive didn't take an awful lot. They had already destroyed the Syrian air force, but there was no way for them to do that in secret. Now, um, the last thing the Israelis wanted was to give the United States of America <clears throat> any chance to say, no, 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 stop now. You done it. Yeah, you know, the Russians might, might intervene now. Don't, you don't need to go on heights. You <laughs> look, you got the Sinai, you got Gaza, you got West Bank. My God, don't do this. That's what they didn't want. Now the Israelis, are very adept <clears throat> at uh, preferring to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. And they knew that the USS Liberty would intercept all the inf information they needed to wire back to Washington and say, look, the Israelis are going up in the Golan. The Israelis just didn't want to give our ambassador or our military attache or our defense minister, McNamara at the time, any chance to say, look, you do this and you're gonna pay a price, don't do this. They didn't want that, and so they went ahead, and it was <laughs> they seized the, the Golan Heights. That's the first uh, and the best, I think, uh, uh, speculation. The second one has to do with prisoners. <clears throat> now, the, the Israeli army came down through the Sinai on three axes, right? And they captured lots of Egyptians that couldn't defend themselves, uh, and they ended up with a couple of hundred prisoners of war. Uh, and they gathered in this place uh, right off, right off uh, in the Sinai, uh, right off the Mediterranean there. And, uh, you know, the prisons of war are a real pain. <clears throat> That's why drones are so great. You know, you just kill them. You don't, have to, you don't have to feed them. You don't have to water them. You don't have to guard them. And, you know, the Israeli army was not all that big. Uh, they didn't want to be you know, deflected by having to guard all these prisoners or feed them and water them. And so um, the, uh, there were two Israeli journalists there that watched the Israelis uh, shoot up these prisoners and put them in a ditch. Now, they have written books about this. No one has disputed their authenticity. But the second theory would be that since the this U.S intelligence collection ship, the USS Liberty was only 13 nautical miles offshore, and they could see what was going on, which they you know, uh, capture the, the SIGINT, the signals intelligence, that uh, the last thing Israelis wanted was for the American public or anyone to know, even the uh, US Navy, what they were doing with these Egyptian prisoners. Now, they did do those things with the Egyptian prisoners, 
whether or not that was the enough to explain uh, why why this all happened, I'm not sure. The other factor, of course, is Russia. Uh, they didn't want uh, they didn't want Russia to be involved, and they could get the U.S. involved and could pretend that it was an Egyptian ship that uh, sunk sunk the Liberty. There might be extra insurance there. So, what what I want to emphasize is the difference between what we know what happened and what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And the reason we don't know it is because nobody has had the guts to go and ask. Right. So tell us. You know, well, you go back it. to go back to what was going on at CIA at the time, uh, and I mean, you said you had a window into this because of you know the fear that the Soviet Union might become involved, but so. What all did you know then? Well, I didn't know about the uh, McNamara and Johnson conversation with Admiral Geis. Uh, that was, of course, very closely held. And I'm not even sure anybody at, uh, at CIA headquarters was apprised of that. Uh, and, uh, you know, all we knew was that the Israelis had done this wonderful job, <laughs> but that, that, that it was uh, the wrong ship. And... Uh, uh, there was a lot of a lot of consternation, but when we got the the intercepts, uh, we knew that they had done it deliberately, mm -hmm. and uh, you know there and that were was right else. away. You guys got the intercepts right away. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, it comes through NSA, and they're shared with us. And you know, it was like the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, we also know that that second attack was a crock that it never happened, uh, but we were we were deprived of the opportunity to put that in our publications and share it with Congress and other people. Even Fulbright was full speed ahead on the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. So there are limits to what intelligence can do. I didn't know chapter and verse, and I think it's a 50-50 chance that no one, except mm -hmm. maybe the director himself, was was involved in, uh, in knowing. He would have had no role to play, but in knowing that uh, the commander-in-chief, Lyndon Johnson, had told Admiral Geis to withdraw those planes and let the Israelis off uh, scot-free, mm -hmm. and then participate in a cover-up which lasted, you know, 40, 45 years. You know, it's uh, Admiral Moore, uh, before he died, and he was, you know, he was a straight-arrow Navy admiral. He was just shocked at all this. And, you know, one of the things he said, I have this in, I think I could find it. Yeah, he says, you know, um, uh, Moore and U.S. Ambassador Ed Peck, a friend of mine who served many years in the Middle East, uh, they both condemned uh, Washington's attitude toward Israel as, quote, obsequious, unctuous subservience at the cost of the lives and morale of our service members and their families, end quote. Well, that's what it was. And uh, if you look at the only sensible State Department advisor that LBJ had in those days, George Ball, he wrote a book about this, Passionate Attachment. It's an incredible book. Guess what? <laughs> Look for somebody to review it. Huh? This is 50 years ago. Has it been reviewed? Well, maybe in, you know, in, uh, in consortiumnews.com. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, so this all is kept out of uh, circulation. Americans don't know uh, the first thing about the liberty. And maybe it would be, you know, Moore did his own investigation, okay? And he, he uncovered the fact that the Navy lawyer, the Navy lawyer turned out to be the Navy liar, and he had a pang of conscience before he too died, and he, he admitted, you know, I just did what they told me to do. Uh, we, uh, we were told to say that it was a terrible mistake and the Israelis have apologized, so just let it be. Uh, his name was Captain Boston, and, uh, you know, he, he admitted all this. But the Blue Ribbon Independent Commission that Moore assembled to look into this uh, made just, you know, let me just name two of the, the conclusions. Quote, unmarked Israeli aircraft dropped napalm canisters on the USS Liberty Bridge, fired 30 millimeter cannon and rockets into the ship, Survivors estimate 30 or more sorties were flown over the ship by a minimum of 12 attacking Israeli aircraft. Number two, the torpedo boat attack involved not only the firing of torpedoes, but machine gunning of Liberty's 
firefighters, and stretcher bearers. The Israeli torpedo boats later returned to machine gun at close range three of the Liberty's life rafts that had been lowered into the water by survivors to rescue the most seriously wounded, end quote. Now, this is not McGovern. This is not some anti-Semite. Uh, this is Admiral Thomas Moore, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who, who took it upon himself to, his, to, to his, appoint his own blue ribbon panel of Navy and other people, lawyers and so forth. And th this was their two of their findings. So yeah, it was pretty bad. And uh, uh, I am going down. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I'd still make it uh, down to Arlington Cemetery, as I have every every year where there's a small gathering now. We had a rather large one last year for the 50th anniversary, but there's an unmarked, well, it's a marked grave now of uh, some of the survivors uh, that they couldn't figure out who was who and which head belonged to which torso. Uh, that's a very moving ceremony. Uh, lately, uh, an, a, a, uh, actually a, a general came uh, two years ago, and so some Navy brass is gradually becoming aware of this indignity and we are getting a little bit respect and the Arlington Cemetery folks are are very accommodating normally. Hey, let me tell you about the sponsors of this show. First of all, Mike Swanson. He is the author of the great book, The War State, about the permanence of America's World War II military empire uh, through the Truman, Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations, the rise of the new right military industrial complex uh, after World War II, the war state by Mike Swanson, and also get his great investment advice to protect your financial future there at wallstreetwindow.com. He has a great understanding of what the hell is going on in these financial markets, wallstreetwindow.com. Unless I know he'll tell you, you got to have at least some of your savings. You must know uh, some of your savings, however much it is, you got to have metals. And so what you do is you go to Roberts and Roberts Brokerage Inc. Uh, gold, silver, platinum, palladium. Uh, they have a very small uh, brokerage fee in order to process for you and, and get you the very best deal. And if you buy with Bitcoin, there's no premium at all uh, for your purchases of gold, silver, platinum, palladium. So check those guys out. Roberts and Roberts Brokerage Inc. at rrbi.co. Do you ever play baseball? rrbi.co and uh, as I mentioned Zencash is uh, a great new digital currency it's also an encrypted method of um, uh, internet messaging and document transfer and all kinds of things uh, for your business uh, for your secret conspiracies uh, Zencash.com check that out at zensystem.io you can read all about how it works uh, every last detail of course at zensystem.io. And then there's this book about how to run your technology business like a libertarian. It's called No Dev, No Ops, No IT. And each of those is one word, three words, you know, get it? Yeah. No Dev, No Ops, No IT. It's by Hussein Badakhchani. And it's about how to run your business right in a libertarian way. LibertyStickers.com. I guess Rick didn't like the great new website, so we'll have to wait. Someday we'll get a new website. There's still a lot of good stickers on there, but we've got a lot of good art that's not up there yet. I don't know, man. I don't know, man. LibertyStickers.com. That's the new slogan. I don't know. Um, and Tom was Liberty Classroom. If uh, you like learning things, I'll get a commission if you sign up uh, by way of the link on my website. And listen, if you want a new, and the reason my website is down is my own broken servers, uh, but if you want a new good-looking website like the one I do have when it's up and running at scotthorton.org, uh, then check out expanddesigns.com slash scott, expanddesigns.com slash scott, and you will save 500 bucks on your new website. All right, now, so if the attack had succeeded and the ship had been sunk, they would have just blamed it on Egypt? That was the Israeli intent. Uh, whether they would have gotten away with it, well, <laughs> God, you tell me, Scott. If uh, LBJ was unwilling uh, to let uh, let his aircraft uh, do battle with who was attacking the Liberty, uh, I suppose one could reason that uh, that would be covered up as well, and it would be blamed on the Russians, and that would be a big that would be blamed on the Egyptians, 
and and the Russians. And what the Israelis did want was the U.S. to get involved militarily. So that's a, another a possible explanation as to why they tried to sink the whole thing and leave no survivors. The more predominant explanation, of course, is that the the machinery, uh, the uh, the we used to do these things on tape, the tapes of all those conversations that happened in uh, in the Sinai and elsewhere between the, the control tower and, and Tel Aviv and so forth, that they were all uh, perishable and could be uh, sunk to the bottom of the med. Nobody would know, know what, what really happened, and the Israelis would be free to spin their own yarn. So, well, and perhaps yeah. part of their calculation in the first place was don't worry about LBJ, we can count on him. Well, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> that was the case then, and even more unfortunately now, this is the case now, and we're talking about Iran now, and there is no reason in God's earth that Iran poses a strategic or even tactical hostility position toward the United States of America. Uh, the Israelis try to make it seem that they do pose a danger to them. And indeed, uh, Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, now actually part of the Lebanese government, uh, who do have the with they do have the wherewithal to <clears throat> to uh, uh, fight the Israelis once the Israelis attack southern Lebanon. That's new. <laughs> that was shown in, in on the ground, so to speak, about six or seven years ago. So the Israelis uh, feel like they don't have total dominance over that part of the world. So the best thing for them would be get would be to snooker uh, someone like uh, Donald Trump and John Bolton into starting a dust up, which would allow them to uh, wreak uh, air and missile damage mm -hmm. on their arch rival Iran. The other thing I'll say about Iran is that probably no one has told Trump this, but this charge that Iran is the foremost <clears throat> sponsor of international terrorism. That was true 40 years ago, okay? 40, 40 years ago. It's not true now. It's not true at all. Who well, is? The U.S. has been fighting for Iran since 2001, so <laughs> I don't know what the hell they're complaining about. Maybe, maybe they're mad because the Iranians really owe us a drink or something after giving them Baghdad and backing the Hazaras in Afghanistan this whole time for them and um, giving them an excuse to increase their power and influence in Syria in order to fight the CIA's al-Qaeda terrorists there, you know. Yeah. I guess, you know, I, I'd resent that too. Anyway, we don't want to do, we don't want to redo too much of the other day's interview. I wanted to point out that when we were talking the other day about Dennis Blair went and told the Israelis, we're not going to have another USS Liberty incident. This is what you referred to in our last interview, that now this is what we're talking about, USS Liberty incident, for those who, who didn't know. Um, it's the biggest deal in the whole world that people have never heard of. And then, of course... As you're saying, the fact that people have never heard of it goes to show just how powerful the Israel lobby is in the United States of America. That There's no History Channel special about this, and there's not going to be. Yeah, it was actually uh, Admiral uh, Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint oh, Chiefs Mullen. of Staff, I always screw that up. the Israeli counterparts on this at a time when they were actually uh, threatening to, to do something and get us involved. So... He read the riot act to them, and uh, that was just sort of his ace in the hole, yeah. saying, look, we know what you did. We know what you did on June 8th, 1967. You think you've hidden that from, from us? Well, not from us, not not from us Navy admirals, all right? right. Don't even think about trying to do something like that again. And that's just amazing <laughs> that, that he would invoke that to them in that context. And it does go to show how worried the Obama group was in 2012 about what Netanyahu was going to do. Uh, well, you know, uh, what's really well, interesting yeah, is, uh, is that um, the Israelis kept kept threatening to do it anyway. Uh, now, we discussed uh, ad nauseum how the U.S. intelligence estimate said in 2007, November, that Israel, that, that Iran had stopped working on a nuclear weapon four years earlier, right? We knew about that. And yet the Israelis kept telling our statesmen... <laughs> statesman, our military and our president, oh, no, 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 they're doing it. They're working on a nuclear and we have to zap them. We have to zap them. Well, what happens? Well, um, 
U.S. Uh, statesman, so to speak, uh, at the State Department and in the New York Times. And I'm thinking of uh, David Sanger, who tells this story with great pride. Long story short, we bought the Israelis off because we thought they were going to attack Iran and we didn't want to get involved. And so we said, look, this is what we could do. Have your intelligence guys in Mossad talk with our guys at CIA and NSA. We can develop this oh, this this virus. Could we, well, let's call it Stuxnet. Okay, yeah. And and what we'll do is we'll we'll not only fool around with the electronics. We will destroy. Yeah, we can destroy Iranian centrifuges, the most advanced ones that they've built. We'll destroy as many as we can. And uh, would then would you please then not if we do that. Together, would you please not not attack Iran? That's what went down. That's how Stuxnet got involved. It was a it was to preempt what the Israelis were going to do on the basis of their false claims that the Iranians were working on a nuclear weapon. Now you what you know what happened with Stuxnet? Yeah, it did get out. It did cause immeasurable damage. And in you know one can reason or one can argue that destroying physically destroying centrifuges, sure they're they're uh, developing nuclear fuel, uh, but I Iran has this great big domestic nuclear energy program, and there was not an iota of evidence that they were turning that into a weapons-related program. And yet, Israel intelligence dominated just like it dominated before the attack on Iraq. That's how serious all this is. Yeah. And the, the thing is, of course, most Americans know neither chapter nor verse on this, given the you know, witness the fact that here I am in this big church of very progressive people, and out of 300, only three had even heard about the USS Liberty. Yeah. All right. Now, listen, I want to mention uh, real quick here. I have interviews. I I'm having server problems, so some of the older archives are down, but you can find them all on YouTube, everybody. And there's Joe Metters. There's actually two different interviews of Joe Metters, and then there's another one of Ron Kukal. That's K-U-K-A-L. And uh, both of those gentlemen, survivors of the USS Liberty attack, that you can find the archives. And in fact, when I searched YouTube, Scott Horton and USS Liberty, there are five or six results for Ray McGovern interviews in the past where we've talked about this as well. If people want to go back and take a look at those and share them around, because it is such a shocking story. But now, so I'm glad we still have a few minutes here uh, to talk about what's going on in the Gaza Strip, uh, Ray. And you said you're going to an action this afternoon there. Um, in D.C. So listen, um, I just saw uh, This Is Gaza is a great uh, Twitter feed to follow. And they've got pictures from the protest march today. Just a massive sea of people. And they're playing volleyball and they're having a good time. And people might say they're a bunch of Hamas terrorists. But yeah, actually, they look like a bunch of Americans. <laughs> you know, if you if you took the context away, they're just humans like everybody else. And and here they are doing an MLK style, Gandhi style, um, nonviolent action to just protest the fact that they're in prison simply for being born the wrong religion. Well, yeah, it's uh, it's about the most horrendous uh situation you can imagine. Uh, I've been over to uh, Israel and the West Bank a couple of times, and, uh, and uh, none of those occasions was I able to get into Gaza. I was on the U.S. boat to Gaza. Um, this was in uh, 2011, okay? Now, that, what's that, seven years ago? Uh, the previous year, um, the Mavi Mamara, a very large uh, boat, uh, Turkish uh, flagged, was shot up by the Israelis together with a couple of other ships, uh, on one of which Anne Wright, my colleague, was. Now, they killed nine people. Including an American citizen, too. That's exactly shot him right. point blank range in the head as he was yeah. already down laying on the ground. Yeah. And uh, so here we are the next year. What we did was we said, look, we need a U.S. flagged ship. We took up donations and we got we got a really nice uh, medium sized uh, boat put together and a, a terrific uh, tarpaulin over the top with a, a, a boat sized U.S. American flag. OK, uh, we gathered in in um, in Athens and we were ready to sail and uh, we had a, a terrific boatload of people, including guess what? People from The New York Times people from Reuters, people from Bloomberg, 
In other words, this was going to be a big deal, right? Uh, we had other, we had dignitaries on there. As soon as I remember the name of Alice Walker was with us, you know, I mean, this was a big deal and we we're all really enthusiastic because number one, it was an American flagship. What would the Israelis do to that? And number two, we had a, uh, a special forces guy from the former Israeli, a former guy from the Israeli army who went, who dove under our ship every morning to make sure that the propeller had not been severed as two other of these ships had had, had happened to them. So what happens? OK, so so we're ready to go. And all of a sudden we hear, uh, no, your air conditioner doesn't pass inspection. Air conditioner? We don't have any air conditioner. They're talking about a fan. Okay. Oh, so we smelled a rat. Guess what? Obama went to Netanyahu and he said, look, uh, uh, Bibi, we, we got this uh, ship now. Uh, it's really a boat. Uh, we got about 50 people. They, they want to get into Gaza just to, you know, show the flag and go through the blockade. So please don't please sink don't, it now. Please don't shoot it up like it did last year with the Marvy Mummer and the others. OK. okay? And uh, we get this uh, sphinx like smile from Netanyahu. And Obama says, now, please, look, you know, this is a U.S. flagship. So, you know, you're not going to do what you did last, last year. No answer from Netanyahu. So what does Obama do? He leans all over the Greeks who needed a lot of financial aid at the time and still do. He said, look, you let those boats sail from Greek harbors. No more IMF loans, folks. You got that? My God. I mean, you want to talk about subservience, unctuous obedience to a, a, a country other than your own. That's what happened. So what do we do? We sailed anyway. <laughs> we got our captain in a whole peck of trouble and we had to bail him out in U.S. courts. But he sailed and we got nine nautical miles off out of Piraeus, out of Athens. And it was the most exhilarating um, 20, 25 minutes I've ever experienced. And then the Ninja Turtle uh, uniformed uh, PT boats Greek Coast Guard uh, intercepted us and very apologetically. I mean, look, here's Greece, a seafaring nation for like 100 million years. Right. <laughs> and they're saying, oh, sorry, we can't let you out of our waters. And we say, who says? Well, we can't tell you who said, you know, so we smell that rat. There was a standoff for about an hour and they, they pleaded with us. And finally, we said, well, now, they, now they're now they going to board us and shoot us up or not shoot us up. At least they're bored us. We don't want that. We took the ship. We, we took the boat back. And that was the end of the U.S. boat to Gaza. So, you know, this is really, really uh, flagrant uh, bowing to uh, a guy like Netanyahu. When if Obama couldn't have said, said, look, let these guys through which he didn't. Well, nobody, Trump's not going to do that either. And Gaza, of course, is the flashpoint here. Um, the Palestinians, for listeners that haven't followed this, uh, with, uh, with silent marches proclaiming their right to return to their homes, which were taken over by the Israelis, uh, they get shot up. Uh, last count, I think, was 119 people killed, okay, by Israeli snipers, uh, 13,000, okay, count that, 13,000 injured. They shoot at your leg with these bullets that explode uh, on their way out the size of a golf ball, okay? And there was no particular reason for the Israelis to do this. No, no one was armed. And the New York Times, you'll see, will blame this all on Hamas. And so will our representative at the U.N. So it's a very disgraceful uh, performance by our government, all because no one heeded the the warning of our first president, also a general. His name was Washington, who said, you know, the worst thing we can do in foreign affairs is have a passionate attachment to another country on the false belief that the objectives and the behavior of that country coincide, coincides, coincide with our own. And that's what we've had with Israel ever since John Kennedy was killed. And that's what we have now in spades. All right, everybody. That's the great Ray McGovern, former CIA analyst and uh, co-founder of Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, regular writer at ConsortiumNews.com and Antiwar.com. And check out his own website at RayMcGovern.com as well. Thanks again, Ray. Appreciate it. I was welcome. 
All right, so you guys know the deal. Uh, Foolsaron.us for the book, scotthorton.org, and youtube.com slash scotthortonshow for all the interviews. 4,500 of them now going back to 2003 for you there. Read what I want you to read at antiwar.com and at libertarianinstitute.org. And follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show. Thanks.